is um, my goal in doing this is is to look at Psalm 23 through two lenses. One is a strictly uh, the shepherd motif, and the other is through um, uh, another uh, approach that David takes. And the beauty of the psalm is that both, I think, are legitimate. If you ever do a lot of like deep dive into Psalm 23, the scholars debate what is which which option is better, and, and I think it's both. You can do that with literature. Um, I was uh, reading recently about Tolkien, and that when he was still alive, uh, someone came up to him and asked him if he had done a prophet, priest, and king motif in the series. Um, the prophet would be Gandalf, the priest would be Frodo, uh, and then the king, of course, is Aragorn, for the three of you who care about this. And when he, when sh and he was shown the evidence by a fan, he goes, that was not my intention, but I think that is a legitimate interpretation. So on one level, you, you didn't need all that. On the other level, this works at the same time. That's, that's the beauty of, of, of good writing, um, is that you, you, can, you can see it from various angles. So, so the, the most basic approach to, to the Shepherd Psalm is to see that David keeps that motif going all the way through. However, when you come to verse 5 and 6, it's the hardest to see it there. Because our natural reading may actually miss some of that. So let's read Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6. They just come through the valley uh, of, of shadowy death. Um, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, um, when, when my wife was pregnant... We, with, with our son, because we, we were going to be new parents, this is all a brand new experience to us, we spent an inordinate amount of time getting ready for it. Uh, Manna dragged me to a lot of things, but I knew I was obligated to go. And one of them was we went to uh, uh, baby classes. I don't know, I don't know what to call it. It was run by the hospital. Um, it was like baby and labor class. So forgive me if I'm just completely not describing this well. And one of the advantages was, you know, they talked about what the labor process was like. They actually showed you all the equipment, you know, you can see, it's not scary. And it was, I mean, I mean it was just a new experience to us. So, so we were nervous about a lot of things. They showed us how to swaddle a baby and, um, and all that sort of stuff. And it, it was good. We, we spent an enormous amount of time getting, getting uh, a plan uh, or preparing for it. We, we uh, did ultrasounds. We did two ultrasounds. Um, one was by order of the doctor, the, your standard one. Um, and then a professor at Southern... Um, he was in um, a gynecologist, and so he helped run the pro-life clinic that's still in operation in Louisville. And so for, sem for seminary students, uh, you were allowed to go in for free 3D ultrasound. And they loved it because we came in to celebrate that we've got a baby. Right? They didn't have to convince us anything. We were like a relief to them. And, of course, we didn't realize that until particularly after uh, we had Evangel we did it again. That we were actually giving them a service by, and so we got to see uh, Elijah, you know, 3D. That was really cool. Um, in my office is still a photo from the 2D ultrasound. It's a paperweight. It was a gift, a uh, Christmas gift or something, and it's a the best photo of him, you know, a little side photo you get. And it's a paperweight, so I still have that in my office. Um, and of course, we we had to uh, paint decorate a room, although that didn't apply much to Elijah. Uh, we were moving when he was born. When Elijah was two days old, I was preaching uh, a trial sermon at Goshen where I ended up serving for six years. And so we had not been able to really get a room ready. Uh, we had a crib, but it was too big to just carry through a doorway. So we never set it up because we were praying the Lord would help us move. So Elijah was actually in a bastinet for his first few weeks in the living room. You know, um, It was an antique one, too, and I nearly broke it by tripping over it in the middle of the night. Um, but uh, we had baby showers galore. Um, you know, I was a youth pastor, and we did it there. My home church threw us one. Um, you know, our family did one. And we were so poor that we, we, we would not have survived without those, those baby showers. Picked out his name, right? When we were in high school, uh, his name, uh, Amanda had a, uh, a sugar baby, if, if you will, right? She took one of those classes. You had to carry around the sugar. We named him. Uh, so this, this would be in 2002. Elijah was born in 2008. Uh, we named him Elijah James McDonald, born August 26, 2008. Elijah was born Elijah Edward McDonald, born 
uh, when was he born? October 10th, 2008. We were off by about six weeks. Uh, and the only thing changed was his middle name, uh, which is kind of creepy. It really is creepy. Uh, but we, we had his name picked out, and we had a bag of clothes ready to go go to the hospital, right? It had the diapers in it. It had change of clothes, right? I had, I had that uh, size 12 months um, Brian Brom football jersey, U of L. Uh, that he wore the first. He was born 12 hours before U of L kickoff, so he was wearing that his first day on earth. Uh, we, we, we did all that. And, and the reason you do that is because preparation is a massive stress reliever. If, if you're prepared, then when the moment of truth comes, you have nothing to worry about. And, and leaders are, are do well in letting their, the people they lead know that everything has been prepared, right? Um, um, you just think about that in, in your own life. Like, we, we have vacation in a few weeks, and um, my family wants to know we have a car rental, we have hotels, we have uh, places that we're going to go, we know where we're going to leave, all of that. And when all that is planned, it, it, life, life just runs a whole lot smoother. Well, you'll, you'll notice here that that is the work of a shepherd. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, that word table is interesting. You can see why many people come to verse 5 and they think that the shepherd motif has actually been bypassed. It ended at verse 4, right? The, your rod and your staff come for me. But I think you can pretty easily read this with the shepherd motif. What is a table? A table is a place where you eat. You, know, you don't have to complicate the definition. It's what you use a table for. Now, you may use your kitchen table for a host of things. But a table, a simple definition would be, is a place where you gather to eat. For sheep, that is a field. Sheep don't have tables the way we think of tables, but they do have places they eat. You want them to eat in this field, this table. You don't want them to eat in this field or table. And so what you have here, I believe, is a narrative in Psalm 23. You, you start over here, verses 1 to 3, right? Uh, quiet, still waters and all that sort of stuff. And then it comes time with the change in the season. You've got to move the sheep from this field to this other field. And, and in order to get there, we saw last week, is you have to go through that dark valley. right? It's just, it's just, you just have to do that. You, you don't have cattle trailers just to haul them all up and, and send them over. Rather, you have to go on this journey. By verse 5, I believe that they have actually arrived at this other field. And, and it is called a table. Now, much like you would if you're raising cattle or any other uh, uh, farm animal, is, is that you have to get everything ready for that. When we got our, our, our puppy, uh, who just turned one last month, uh, she's still crazy. Not as crazy as she was a year ago, but she's still pretty crazy. Um, we had to get the house ready, right? We had to make sure our dog was going to have uh, a bowl to put food in and, and water in and a leash and, and shots and all that sort of stuff. So, too, that before the shepherd could move the sheep, relocate the sheep from this field to that field, he has to prepare the table, the field, for the sheep, right? Because there are a lot of dangers in that field that he has to, has to take care of. And so that is, what he, that is what he's doing. He's preparing the field to see to it that it is safe, protected, secure, and that they will be uh, satisfied. And so he would take several trips uh, before heading over there just to make sure everything is, is, is good to go. And, and you notice that he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Now, notice here that if, if this motif does continue in verse 5, and I think it does, notice how David personifies this. Now, he's already said, your, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You remember that the, 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 the pronouns change. You go from... Um, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads us quiet. Now it's you lead me. You comfort me. And here it is again. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David has, has uh, uh, personalized this psalm all of a sudden. And that is why one of the reasons why we think that David wrote this psalm when he was running from Absalom. He's had to flee Jerusalem. Absalom is, is defiling his, his household and is sitting on his throne of Jerusalem, claiming himself to be king. And David is losing his kingdom, and he writes this psalm. Not about how the Lord is my king, but rather the Lord is my shepherd. And he was in that dark valley, waiting to, to return, and that you prepare a table for the presence of my enemies, as a shepherd would his, his sheep. Now, sheep have several enemies, as you can imagine. We, we've talked about this, that sheep are dumb, uh, they are defenseless, 
and uh, they are prone to wander off. Therefore, they, they're in constant danger as a result. One is uh, dangerous plants. Uh, to prepare this table, the shepherd has to search out poisonous plants and to seek out ample water. Right? So uh, sheep will drink anything, like a dog will drink anything, right? and eat just about anything. And, and so what you have to do is, is you have to try to get rid of uh, poisonous sources of water and poisonous sources of food. And plants can be quite poisonous. Uh, Elijah went through a Bear grill stage. I don't know if you know who Bear grills is. Bear grills is a British, former British Navy SEAL. They don't have Navy SEALs, whatever they're called over there. And he's a survival man now, right? He had a show called Man vs. Wild. Elijah loved this show. In one of his early episodes, he, he, he stops, and he, you know, he, he's trying to survive wherever he's at. Um, and uh, uh, he stops, he says, look at this plant. This plant right here is really beautiful. You can eat that. That's good for you. It's got all kinds of vitamins. He's British. And he goes, right next to it is another plant. It's pretty, too. It looks a lot alike it, doesn't it? Goes, this plant will kill you. It's what Socrates ate when he died. And it is right there. And a good shepherd will be able to tell the difference between what you can eat. Like, I have a rule when it comes to mushrooms. Don't eat it. Right? I, I, I am not sophisticated and educated enough to know the difference between a good mushroom and a bad mushroom. And I want to know who figured that out. <laughs> right? Because thousands of years ago, you weren't looking under a microscope. Someone had to say, all right, we got ten types of mushrooms here. We got ten volunteers. Hopefully three of you survived this. Right? And so there's, you know, the early uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton's ancestor, right? You know, uh, on, on a stone. Okay, Kenneth number one, he had a bad night, but he survived. Okay. Uh, so if you want to torture someone, we'll give him that. Uh, candidate number two, right? The dead. Candidate number three, still alive, but we'll see it till next morning, right? Someone had to do that, and uh, um, that's the way I see it. But but so dangerous plants are 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 a problem. Um, one plant, if you read uh, a shepherd's book of Psalm twenty-three, uh, Keller looks at one plant, a common uh, poisonous plant. It says that it would make the uh, sheep become paralyzed. Stiffen up like blocks of wood and simply succumb to the toxic poisons from the plants. Dangerous plants. There's also dangerous animals. He searches for signs of wolves, coyotes, and, of course, bears. And David mentions lions when he goes up against um, uh, Goliath. And so you, you need to know where, where all these are. When, when we raised chickens, we, we had a chicken hawk problem. Uh, one of our deacons, he had a fox problem. And he went from having a, a decent business of uh, selling uh, eggs and whatnot. And one day it was wiped out uh, pretty much. He was down to like a rooster in one hand or something like that. I mean, it was pretty much wiped out because a couple of foxes got in there. Right? And you got to know where, where they are and how, how you deal with them. Another dangerous thing, an enemy, if you will, was vipers. Particularly the adder, which is a small brown snake that burrows itself underground. And so... Um, what a good shepherd would do is walk through the field looking for the holes in the ground uh, that indicate there is an adder down there. And he knew how to uh, get rid of them, right? You could, you could cover up the hole with a certain thing that keeps the sheep away from the hole. It also keeps the adder from coming out, so it will eventually uh, just, just, just die out. Uh, a, a bite from one of these adders will kill the sheep. And so, so you have to get rid of, of all of that, that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, so he prepares a table before me, the presence of my enemies. And then you'll notice, you anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Well, anointing the head of oil, that, that sounds sort of a priestly idea, doesn't it? But, but you have to do this with sheep as well. A sheep have to be anointed as well. In fact, a good shepherd would have a certain homemade concoction that was an oil designed to protect the sheep. Right? Remember, the context is you, you, you prepare me a table, and part of that preparation, the presence of my enemies, is you anoint my head. Uh, so uh, three, three purposes of this oil to protect sheep. The first is to repel insects. Again, if you read Keller here, he describes there's a particular insect that gets inside of a lamb and drives them crazy, as you, as you can imagine, right? And they will do everything they can to get the insect out. And so one of the things they do is they will run into trees. Right? And, and as you can imagine, that's, that's not good. You don't want that. They get really aggressive and, and everything else. Um, and uh, uh, so what this anointing oil does, um, he says it's probably a mixture of olive oil and sulfur. 
Um, it was designed to kill the larva eggs inside the sheep's nose, and it served as a repellent that kept other flies away. Um, and so it, 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 it protected the sheep and it, and it healed the sheep. Uh, so you anoint my head with oil, right? No, and naturally it's, it's, it's the head. It also prevented conflicts. In short, mating season happens, and men can get pretty aggressive during mating season. What sheep will do in trying to impress the girl sheep is they will just buck heads and all that sort of stuff. Men can be pretty crazy, right? And so uh, what you don't want is, is for scars and bruising and whatnot to take place, and that turn into an infection. And so what this oil does is prevents infection and helps the, the head um, heal um, a little, little quicker. Finally, the oil was used for shepherd to heal wounds. Um, so uh, they, of course, they're butting heads and all that, all that sort of stuff. But one of the things was in, a, in an infection that happens, uh, it was a scab. It, it was uh, um, it was a irritating and a highly contagious disease common among sheep. And, and it was a parasite that got into the sheep. And what would happen is, is that when sheep would rub up against each other, one sheep would infect the other. And so if you're not careful, it can consume the entire fold. And that's not good at all. This is a very dangerous parasite. And, and so what the shepherd would do was mix oil consisting of linseed oil, sulfur, and other chemicals that controls the disease. And so what you have then in verse 5 is... You, you, you come at the end of, of your travel through the, the dark valley. And what the sheep discover is, first of all, they have a field, a table, that is prepared for them. <coughs> they, they, they will not go hungry. Think about it. If Sheep are very timid, and they get into routine. And so if you take them out of the first field where, um, where, where quiet waters and, and all that, you start to wonder, well, will there be food at this next field? And when they arrive, they realize... It's an abundance of, 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 of food. I think I shared this a few weeks ago when the drought was really bad here in Kentucky about three, four weeks ago. Um, there's a legislator who's, who has a spouse who, who, who raises cattle, really big in the cattle. And uh, he, he put online, he said, this is my last field. Now, the grass was pretty thick, and he thought he could make it last for a little while. His point was that if we don't get rain, the cattle won't have food. Right? And it's his job um, uh, in charge of the cattle to see to it that when he moves the cattle from this field to another field, that it's, the table has been prepared for them. That's what a, a good rancher, a good farmer, a good shepherd does. And so here they come, and when, when they finally make it to the field, they're going to leap with joy, right? Because all of their fears, both in the valley and in the traveling, are taken care of. You have the strength of the shepherd who leads the sheep through the valley, and also the grace of the shepherd that prepares the way and prepares uh, everything in, in, in the very end. That is why you get there, my cup overflows. The King James is beautiful there, right? My cup overflowing. Um, this is a picture of total satisfaction. Uh, Keller thinks that what you have in mind here is you have the quiet waters over in the first field, right? You've got a, a, a lake or something like that. Here he's, he thinks that what's being described here is a well. What, what you would do is, is you would, of course, dig the hole in the ground, and you would bring up the bucket. And when you would pour the water into the trough or whatever, um, the, it would overflow, right? And that overflowing was a sign to the sheep they were never going to run out. Years ago when I was a youth pastor, uh, there was a pizza place in Ointon. Man, it had actually been a delivery girl for that place. Uh, we don't talk about that much. It, there are stories that's pretty funny about that. This is where she did all that. She, um, so so we, we went there, and uh, it was only our families, right before church on Wednesday nights. And the waitress was clearly bored. I mean bored. They played a CMT 24 hours a day, right? So it's Johnny Cash and Tim McGraw all the time. And, and uh, she was just bored to tears. And, and she came by and asked, would you like a refill? I said, oh, I, I, think, I think I'm okay, you know. Um, she said, okay, so you go to the back. And it would be 10 minutes later. Would you like a refill? After like the third time, she thought this is getting kind of ridiculous. So I said, yeah, I'll take a refill. And she, she filled it up good. Everything's happy. We go back and we're not 10 minutes later. I've taken two sips. And I vowed every time she asked, I was going to get a refill. 
And she, she'd come take the cup, she'd refill it, bring it back. I mean, she wouldn't hardly put anything in it. She's just bored, right? I mean, that is, that is a feeling of never running out, right? Um, and that, that, that's the good stuff. So look at the image that we have here of the shepherd. The shepherd is one who provides, leads, and is gracious, gracious to his sheep. As we'll see that in this psalm, the sheep do absolutely nothing. In fact, there's only one verb that is applied to them, and it is in verse 4. Even though I walk. That's the only verb that is applied Excuse me, to the sheep. Everything else is what the shepherd does. So you can go back through there. He, he leads me to green pastures. He leads me uh, uh, still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me past the righteousness. Um, he comforts me. He prepares a table for me. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. So what we see here is the, the sheep learning to rest in the sovereign care of their maker. He's taking care of all this. And this continues in, in, in verse 6. What we get in verse 6 is the importance of not just what is in front of you, the shepherd, but what is behind you. Uh, many of you all know I, I like soccer a lot. And uh, uh, one of the weird things that's tough for Kentuckians in particular to figure out about soccer is that, here you go, Carrie, you have to go backwards to go forward, right? Yeah, it, it's odd. It's odd. If you watch, it's, it's the part of the game people get frustrated with. You do that in basketball, but we don't, we're not critical of it. But in most sports, you want to go forward. But in soccer, actually, if you go back, that actually opens up lanes and open space and stuff. So it's called dropping the ball. It means you just turn around and you go backwards. Uh, with my middle school team, we call it resetting, right? If you get all the way up in the attacking third, you've got nothing there. Instead of just kicking it somewhere, just pause, reset it, go back. You do, again, you do the same thing in basketball. If you're in the corner of the court, right? you're going to swing it back around the perimeter. Same, same sort of idea. The point is, is that those who are behind you are as much a part of the, of the process and the team than those who are in front of you. That's why I tell the players, just because you're a defender doesn't mean you don't play offense. And just because you're an offensive player doesn't mean you don't play defense, right? You, we, we, we go up together, we come back together. What you have here in verse 6 is uh, David directing our attention to what is behind the sheep. All along, our focus has been what is in front of the sheep, the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me through the valley of shadow of death, right? Now you see he's talking about behind. So uh, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And when you notice here, the goodness and mercy aren't following the sheep because the sheep are leading. That's the key idea. Because sheep don't lead. That makes no sense. They have nowhere to take you that you want to go. They don't know how to lead. They're dumb. They're not very sophisticated animals. Now, our dog can lead us. Your dog will want to lead you. Your cat is worthless. But your dog will want to lead you, right? Think, think about it. You're, I tell you what. Put your dog on a leash, all right? And just follow. They will take you somewhere. Right? Whatever has been bothering their nose, they will get you there. And when they get there, they've got somewhere else they want to go. Right? Sheep aren't like that. Sheep are like, okay. When we got our cat, okay? My wife and daughter thought, let's get her a leash, and we'll go for a walk with our cat. <laughs> they sell those things for gullible women. I'm telling you that right now. No, that is crossing a line. That is, that is just blasphemy. Come on. We're better than the city people. Oh, gosh, that they play in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> what are we talking about? Yeah, so, so think about it, right? If, if, you're, if you're leading sheep, okay, from one field to another, what is behind the sheep? It's the sheep dogs. I have an Australian shepherd, and this is what she does. One of the, things, one of the habits you have to break of a bird collie or a shepherd is this. She's called a shepherd <laughs> for a reason. I've told this story before that when uh, Elijah was a toddler, mom and dad had a border collie, and uh, they still they ha they still have a border collie, just a different border collie. And uh, Elijah was just a little guy back when he was cute, and he would walk up, you know, and that border collie would would go over here, so he'd go the other direction. She'd go over here, he'd go that direction, and they would do this, and I would get so mad, right? I'd pick him up, I'd yell at the dog, and said, "Look, I get it's your nature, 
You're not going to judge my boy. I'm sorry. It just bothered me for some reason, right? You don't herd my son. You do it to the in-laws if you want to. Keep them out. You don't herd my son. I just didn't like that for, for whatever reason. And, and, and that's what you have here. You have the shepherd leading in the front. You have, you have the sheepdogs in the back. And you should, you should catch video of, of sheepdogs. They're fascinating. They, they have an instinct of, of keeping the sheep together, keeping them in the fold. And when they go through the gate, they, they get them all through the gate. And they're fast suckers, right? Uh, if you can watch our dog, just, just she leaps when she gets excited and she runs, right? And it's all part of the instinct. She could fly. When I started running with her... Um, she would take off, get in front of me, turn around, and like hop because she's so much faster than me. And I was sprinting, right? She, she's fast. She's a fast little booger. Well, uh, notice here you have goodness and mercy. Both of them, uh, Spurgeon called them the hounds of heaven. At face value, goodness is God's bounty and blessing, unde uh, undeserved. Mercy is granted when, when it is least uh, deserved. Um, and so you can't, you can't um, enjoy the goodness of God apart from the mercy of God. And you can't enjoy the mercy of God apart from the goodness of God. It, they do go hand in hand. And the idea is, is, is as, as they're going down this journey, yes, they have the, the Lord ahead of them. They have his goodness and his mercy sustaining them along the way. Both are important. His presence and his, 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 his love. So uh, I think I'm stealing this from... I don't know, someone. Goodness to supply every need. Mercy to forgive every sin. Goodness provides. Mercy pardons. Goodness found me. Mercy forgave me. This is probably uh, Lucado. Goodness guides my steps. Mercy picks me up when I fall. Goodness provides for my needs. Mercy pardons me when I sin. And it follows me. He, the shepherd, leads. They follow. And the sheep know that what keeps them together is, is both of them. Both of them are, are crucial. In fact, you'll notice there that, that it, it, is, it, it ends with a climax. Um, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me. Indeed, certainty, goodness and mercy will follow me. Again, if, if the context is right of David fleeing to Absalom, it's amazing he would say that. We usually talk about the goodness of God when things are going well. He reflects on the goodness and mercy of God when things are going poorly. Surely, I, God's goodness and mercy are with me, keeping me down the right path. It is worth meditating on as we, as we go through these valleys, as we go through this life journey. It is God's goodness and mercy that sustains us, that gets us through all of it. And this is why he can conclude there, the last part of verse 6. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's interesting, isn't it, that here, he invites the sheep in. If, if there is a break of the motif, it's here. Because, because David is thinking as a sheep, yes, but he's, he's, thinking, he's, he's thinking as as the son, as God's son. That he would bring him in to his presence. And most people have always seen this as a reference to um, the afterlife. It's amazing. We, we've talked about this in our study of 1 Corinthians 15, there are many who look at the Old Testament and wonder what was the Jewish belief about the afterlife. And we won't rehash that. But I think this verse suggests David anticipated something. That I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, you're not going to dwell in the temple forever. You're going to die. But he's going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right? That, that is the sort of shepherd the Lord is. One who doesn't just lead, not just one who guides, but the one who welcomes. This is a very special, special shepherd. This is, we could call it, the good shepherd. Now, what is the means by which we dwell in the house of the Lord forever? John 10, we've already looked at it. I am the good shepherd, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Anyone who comes to me, I will by no means turn away. And they, they know my voice, and they follow me. What does Jesus take them? Jesus takes his sheep to his presence. And so you can see David's point moving forward. Also, consider Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. For him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. 
The king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you the foundation of the world. What's interesting is, particularly in the ancient Near Eastern world, but we do it now, is sheep and goats are often raised together. But if you know anything about sheep and goats, you know they are like opposites. I think I've shared this, but our, our, my uncle that we buried last week, he was the polar opposite of his brother, my grandfather. My grandfather, if you met my dad, think of, that's my grandfather, right? Except balding. Um, he was a blue-collar mechanic, worked his whole life, uh, from sun up to sundown. Um, that sort of guy, right? A good southerner. My uncle was the opposite. He was more of a sales weasel, right? He was always well-dressed. His clothes were always ironed. When my uh, uh, wife's son and I had to flee, when he was three months old, we had to flee to Owensboro just to just to have a warm place to stay during the ice storm in 2009. Um, we were nervous because he'd never had a baby spend the night in his presence. He'd never been woken up by a screaming child. And his whole house was covered with antiques. And my grandfather didn't have a lot of antiques, except his truck, right? I mean, that was it, right? My uncle covered with antiques. So we were quite worried. What if our son's going to start crawling off, and tear something up, right? Um, Complete opposites, even though they shared the same mother and father. So too sheep and goats. Um, goats, uh, we're here, uh, this is Keller. Sheep are doc uh, docile, gentle creatures. Goats are unruly, rambunctious, can easily upset the sheep. And because they do not feed or rest well together, the shepherd will often separate them for grazing and sleeping at night. What does Jesus say? The day will come. He will stand before the good shepherd. He will separate his sheep from the goats, and for the sheep will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our hope. Uh, it's our hope in the Good Shepherd. All right. Danny, we miss anything? You have to ask him. All right. All right. Well, if y'all don't have anything, let's get out early. How's that sound? We'll get out super early. The clock is faster than I thought.